Somebody asked me to uh, review my life story <laughs> in two minutes, all right? Uh, I was born in Los Angeles about 43, 44 years ago. And uh, when I was a kid, little kid, we moved to Arizona. So I grew up in Arizona and then uh, went to a normal old high school. And uh, then we. Uh, when I applied for college, I applied to somewhere in the East Coast and uh, ended up there. And uh, and then uh, I think it's my junior year, I was supposed to go to a Buddhism class, and uh, and there was this Indian kid in the class from India, and uh, he uh, was sitting outside under a tree, and and he grabbed me and he made me sit down under the tree, and I missed the class. It was like the first class I ever missed, and. Uh, he taught me into, right there, he taught me into going to India. Uh, he said, if you want to see real Buddhism, you have to go to India, you know, and you're not going to get it in the university. And uh, so he taught me into going to India, and he said he would meet me at the Delhi airport on such and such a date. So I went there. He didn't show up. He never went, actually. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said, where are the Buddhists? And they said, oh, you're a thousand years late, you know. They, <laughs> they died out a thousand years ago. <laughs> So I'm like 19, and I'm in India, and I don't know anybody. And, and I started looking for Buddhists, you know. And, and uh, so I met, eventually I ran into the Tibetans and um, started studying with them. And uh, got permission. I got permission from my college to to spend a year there in Dharamsala and, and studied really hard. And then um, my mother was uh, very ill, and uh, we were corresponding. And uh, she had breast cancer, and then it got into her brain. And uh, the doctors told her, just forget it. You know, there's no treatment. And uh, so I said, uh, I talked to some of the lamas in Dhamsala, and they said, tell her to come, and we'll teach her how to die properly. So uh, she came. We were very, very close. And she came, and I drove her in a car from Delhi to Dhamsala, a very hard drive. Uh, and. Uh, in the back of a cab, and uh, she was like unconscious some of the time and stuff like that. And uh, so she came to uh, Dharamsala, and we st she studied with Geshe Dagi uh, about how to die. And the doctors met her and said, "Teach her Dharma because there's nothing else you can do." And uh, so she studied for a few months, and she did studied very well. And then we met His Holiness, and uh, and he encouraged me to go back to the U.S. and uh, study with a great Lama in New Jersey. So, so I went to study with this Lama about 25 years ago, and uh, studied with him. My mother passed away, and uh, stayed uh, stayed with him since then. And uh, at a certain point, he made me a monk, and then. Uh, at a certain point, uh, I started to study at Sarah Monastery in South India. And uh, then about two years ago, I finished the, the course there and finished the Geshe examinations and stuff like that. Um, 
But uh, what was it? <laughs> uh, around 1975, when I first started studying with my Lama in New Jersey, he, uh, we were meditating. I was meditating one day, and something special happened to me. And uh, so I knew I had to work in the diamond business. And uh, I tried. Well, I, I didn't do anything for about eight years. I just studied, and then. Uh, uh, finally, I, I knew it was the right time to get into the diamond business, and that's like trying to join the mafia, you know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I went to all these stores, and uh, they threw me out. They said, "You're crazy, you know. We're gonna let you handle diamonds. You you don't know anything about diamonds, and they're very valuable, and we don't know anything about you." And and I tried so hard. It, it was really funny. I got thrown out of 30 stores, and. Uh, Finally, I met this uh, Israeli guy who was starting a, a diamond company, and he, he let me... I said, I'll wash the floors and I'll do the windows, but you have to let me play with the diamonds, you know, and he said, okay. And uh, so we started this business, and uh, I've worked for him for 16 years now, and uh, it's a huge business now. We have 900 people. Uh, we have a building in Manhattan, you know, uh, but... Uh, the point of me telling you that is that uh, is that it's a big corporation now, and I, I work in the real world. And so somebody asked me to talk about that. You know, how can you do Buddhism in the real world? And you can't work in business for more than a, a few days and not run into a lot of different problems. Uh, in the diamond business, it's really good because you get uh, greed. Uh, we deal in about 30,000 diamonds a day. Uh, big greed, you get people telling you to lie, the boss is always telling you to, not to lie, but you know, misrepresent things. And, and then it's a fashion business, so for a monk it's really challenging because there's beautiful ladies walking through the place all day. And, uh, and then of course you have jealousy of the people and you have a, whenever you have 900 people working together in America, they're always fighting with each other or jealous of each other. There's power struggles going on. And, and how, do you, how do you be a good Buddhist you know, in this office in Manhattan, especially a monk? You know? uh, and we use the money. We use the money for good. We, it helps support like 900 monks. And it's, you know, it's been useful. Uh, that's not why I did it, but it, it's been helpful for that. Um, I did it because something happened, and I knew I had to. Something happened in 1975 while I was meditating, so I knew I had to do that thing. But anyway, um, so so I was thinking you're probably expecting some kind of talk about how to maintain your good Buddhist attitude in in the office, you know, and uh, I could talk about that because I spent many years struggling. Y y if you worked for 15 years in a corporation. You have to struggle with those things, and you have to learn those things. Um, but I was thinking something a little more interesting. <laughs> uh, like I was thinking the difference between my office and uh, Buddha Paradise. You know, I got us thinking about think about the difference between a, a lousy office in Manhattan and uh, and a Buddha Paradise. And I was thinking about the difference between the two. Um, and I was trying to list all the differences. So I think we should. I'm, I don't think everyone can see the board, but we did this in New York. It was fun. All the differences between uh, my office and a Buddha paradise. You know, <laughs> and how to go from one to the other. You know, because it's not really. The goal is not really uh, to be frank. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're nervous at the office, or whether you're calm at the office. It doesn't matter whether you're. It doesn't really matter whether you're virtuous or non-virtuous. Uh, the question is, is bigger than that. You know, uh, I, I got into Buddhism really because of my mother. And uh, she was dying, and I wanted to know what was going on. And uh, really, I'm not here to give a lecture. And I don't, think it's, uh, the, I don't think the Buddha came to this planet to give lectures about how to stay calm at the office. <laughs> um, no, because, because Buddhism is not that. Buddhism is, uh, can you stop dying? You know, can, you, can you stop suffering? You know, can you stop uh, the actual process of death? You know, that's really the question that got me into this red suit. You know? uh, can, you, 
can you do anything about that? That's really why you study Buddhism. I mean, it, a side effect is that it makes you calm. A side effect is that you can get along with other people very nicely. You know, a side effect is that if you have good concentration, you can do all these great diamond deals and <laughs> build this huge company, you know. But uh, that's not the point, you know. The point is, uh, while, you're, while you're in the office, you're getting older. And uh, your body's getting worse and worse, and your hair is falling out, and, and things are starting to break down. And, and it doesn't matter how smart you are, or how talented you are, or how meditate you, how well you can meditate, or, or how virtuous you are even. Uh, you get old, and, uh, and things change, and your body starts to change, and you get sick, and uh, then the HMO means a lot. Like when I was 20, the HMO didn't mean, I could care less about the HMO. <laughs> now I'm like, what's in the HMO? <laughs> 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 you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, it's true, you know? And it's, you just see people dying and getting heart attacks, and all these people you used to deal with are gone or dead or, or something happened to them and, and uh, their, their business went under and what, you know, what, where is it all coming from? I mean, that's the real question. It's not, I didn't come here to talk about uh, how to stay calm in an office while your body is dying, you know, because you shouldn't be calm, you know. <laughs> you should be worried about it. You should be concerned about it, you know. That's the real human condition. That's what you really want to know is how to, to me, it's, it's very uh, interesting. It's like, how do you get from office to a Buddha paradise? You know, can you use the office to get to a Buddha paradise? Uh, not just to be calm at the office and die slowly, calmly. You know, <laughs> it's not interesting for me, you know. The reason I <laughs> became a Buddhist was, and if you can't do anything about it, then maybe it's not, it doesn't matter whether you're calm or not. You know, you're going to die anyway, so you might as well, you know, have a bunch of parties and you know, really. I mean, if, if you can't do anything about those big things, then the little things I don't see. You, whether you're calm or not calm, you can't be calm in Manhattan anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it doesn't much matter. And I don't see that the calm people are that much happier than the uncalm people, because they're all dying. You know, so I, it doesn't make sense to me. I think you have to talk about the, the bigger picture. You know, what would a Buddha paradise be like? And can you get to it? And to me, that's, that's the only crucial thing in my life. And, and if I only have one night to say anything, uh, I think we might as well talk about that. You know. What's a Buddha paradise like? You know? What would it be like? And then can you get there? Is it possible? Uh, that's the real question. That's why you should be here. You know? uh, that's the only real question. Can you stop your death? There's not much time left. Right? Um, so we'll go through it. Um, I was going to go through what a Buddha paradise is like. You know, you're all trying to get to Buddha paradise. I mean, the goal of being a Buddhist is to, is to become a Buddha. <coughs> but I, sometimes I, it's funny, we don't really think very clearly about what that would be like. So I'm going to describe the condition of a Buddha. And then we'll debate whether it's even possible. Okay, so I'll debate, I'll, I'll put up the, what a Buddha is like. You know, what would you be like if you became a Buddha? And then we'll take a break. And I like to stretch and drink something. And then, then we'll come back and we'll discuss if it's possible or not. Okay? So I'll describe a Buddha first. The Buddha has four parts. Okay? Uh, we'll start with uh, Longku. I like to put the Tibetan just... Uh, the first Dalai Lama said... I always put the Sanskrit so people think I'm serious, you know. <laughs> and I'd like you to repeat it. It puts a, a seed in your mind. We call it bakchak. It puts a seed in your mind. All these people came from New York. They all swore they'd never learned Tibetan, and I think almost all of them have now. Uh, and they're all reading pretty well, and it's pretty cool. So you never know. Okay, say longku. 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 Long long okay, longku stands for longchu zopeku, and uh, in, in Sanskrit it's sambhogakaya. I forget all those kaya stuff. Okay, longku means uh, <laughs> longku means the the body that a Buddha has in his or her paradise. Okay, the body that you have in your paradise, and uh, it it has certain marks on it, and and it has a certain qualities. We call ngepanganden. Uh, this is supposedly why you became a Buddhist, is to get this stuff.
Say Nyepa. 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 Nyepa means a definite thing, like fixed, always the same. Uh, Nga means five. And den means they have, they have those. They have five qualities that are always fixed. Like if you get to your own Buddha paradise, there's five things that are always going to be the same. Uh, and the first one is Kung Nyepa. Say ku. Ku. Okay, ku is your is your body. I mean the body is always the same. A Buddha in a Buddha paradise has a certain kind of body. And it's very interesting. Uh, it's not made of flesh and blood and bone. Okay? It's made of light. It's like uh, it's a, there's a big debate about it in the monastery and, and in the scriptures. It's it's suk but not bembo. Okay? <laughs> it's suk but not bembo. Suk means uh, Visible, something you can see, uh, but it's not bembo. It's not physical matter. It's not at atomic particles. Like you can see a Buddha walking around in a paradise, but they don't have this kind of uh, physical matter. It's not like this. This is uh, bound to die. This cannot be fixed. This is defective from the factory. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is. Uh, it has to die. It has to get old. It has to get ugly. It has to get wrinkled. Mine's doing pretty good so far, and. Uh, it, it has to get like that. It always will get like that. Well, the minute you're born, it has to get like that. You can't do anything about it. You know, you can try all these cosmetics and stuff. They just delay it. Uh, while you're buying the cosmetics, it's getting worse. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's like that. And uh, you can't fix it. This body is a loss. This body is going to end up, you know, in a graveyard somewhere, feeding bugs. And, uh, but, but, when you reach a Buddha paradise, you have a body which is made of light. And uh, it doesn't have intestines, it doesn't have internal organs, seriously. It's like just pure light. And, and this body actually transforms into that body. So the, the elements of this body, the different parts of this body, uh, under certain circumstances, with special methods, can turn into that body. And that's the whole game, name of the game. I mean, one quarter of a Buddha is, is the Buddha's body. And you can, the theory, okay, we'll talk about that after the break, okay? Uh, the theory is that you can change this body into that body, and that you have to before you die. It's like a race against time. It's like you have a certain number of years to do it. If you don't pull it off, you die, and, and God knows where you go. Like, supposedly there's terrible places you can go, and you won't have this opportunity again. Uh, it's a very brief window of opportunity now to do something about the body. And when you get there, Kung Nyepa means all Buddhas in his or, their, his or her paradise, they all have the same nature. Their body is made of light. And it, it's not capable of pain. It doesn't have physical pain. It's, it's just beautiful, fantastic. These pictures, I think, sometimes I don't like them because they're like, uh, they don't shine, you know, and they don't, they don't have warmth blazing out of them, and they don't smell the fragrance of them. And, they're, they're just sort of flat on this cloth, you know? <laughs> and, and, I mean, if you really met one, it would be like totally different, I think. It would be like this total glorious, blazing, beautiful thing, you know? And, and uh, it would definitely change according to your culture, you know what I mean? Like, I saw in Russia, a couple, maybe last year, uh, murals from Central Asia of Gandharvian, these were before t Buddhism reached Tibet. And all these tantric deities looked like Western people, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, it's very interesting. They looked, uh, you know, Vajapani looked like a plain old uh, American guy. And it was very beautiful. It was very interesting. And then when it reached Tibet, they got Tibetan. And when it reached China, they got Chinese. When it reached Mongolia, they got Mongolian. What I mean is, it'll be probably your body will look a lot like what you would consider most beautiful to yourself right now. It would be very similar. I mean, a Buddha can look, it, it will be according to your own mental seeds in your own mind, and you will have this beautiful body. And that's Kung Epa. That's one of the five qualities. It's always the same. The body is always the same. It's always like this beautiful, fantastic light, okay? Kung Epa. Next one is uh, Kor.
Say core. 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 core means circle, and it means the people around you. Like all the people you ever run into in a Buddha paradise are high bodhisattvas. They are already highly advanced, spiritually advanced people. You never meet a schmuck in your own Buddha paradise, okay? <laughs> like, the only people you can ever meet are high-level bodhisattvas. Arya bodhisattva means someone who has already seen emptiness directly. Okay, so they're not only a bodhisattva, which happens at the first of the five paths, but they're uh, Arya bodhisattva, which means they've already seen emptiness directly. So you're the only people you ever bump into, the only people you ever see, the only people you ever meet are these uh, incredible... Uh, these incredible beings around you. So you're just surrounded by these people all the time. That's Korangampa, okay? Uh, next is Nangampa. Say Ne. 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 Okay, Ne means the place. And uh, this is the Buddha paradise itself. And it has these special qualities. I, uh, it's supposed to be like this. If you, I like to do this exercise. Like, think of the uh, most ecstatic few moments you've ever had in this life. Okay, pleasure. You know, whether it was uh, whatever it was, I have no idea. You know, uh, but just close your eyes and imagine. We'll do it for like a few seconds. Imagine the greatest pleasure you've ever had in this life. Okay, don't get carried away. Uh, <laughs> every single object in the Buddha Paradise, like if you look at the... If, if we were talking about this room, then the corner of uh, the frame, and the middle of the frame, and the top of the frame, and the bottom of the frame, and this, this slash of gold, and this slash of gold, and, and this little sparkle over here, each, each uh, part each object in this room would give you that same feeling all the time. Okay? And not just one thing, you know, not just your body's feeling like that. Th but every time you looked at something, like if you looked at uh, the threads on the floor, each thread on the floor, each thread in the carpet would give you this emotion like that. You would have that all the time. What I mean to say is every part, every tiny, tiniest piece of every object in this room would give you that same emotion all the time. And every millisecond of thought, you know, just the passing thought like, oh, it's warm in here, or how are you doing, or what am I going to have for dinner, or, you know, any, every little thought would give you the same bliss like that. Every, every object in your world, every piece of every object gives you the same bliss, period. And that's Neng Epa. That's your, that's fixed, that's definite. If you reach a Buddha paradise, that's the way it is. You know, I could go into, there's so many trees, and the, the ground gives way under your feet, and it looks like lapis lazuli, and blah, blah, blah. Doesn't really matter. It could be anything. But every detail gives you the same amount of bliss, much greater bliss than you've ever experienced in this life. Every detail, and every passing second of every detail, gives you that much bliss. That's Neng Empa. Okay. <coughs> How many we got? Three. Three. Oh, this is tough. Okay. Um, <laughs> Doing up, uh, Clinton, you better think of the fifth one. Oh, that's good. Okay, <laughs> say two. 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 two means time, and uh, the time you have to stay there is fixed. Uh, it's always the same. You have to stay there until you pretend to get in, uh, to pass into your final nirvana. Okay, and when do you do that? Uh, is when the last suffering being in the universe has become enlightened. So basically, you're stuck there until... Uh, Tu means you're stuck. There's a fixed uh, time period that you have to stay there. Your sentence is, is fixed. You know, you have to stay in this paradise until the last suffering creature in the entire universe reaches total bliss. You know, and, and only then can you pretend to retire. You know, you, they say, Nyangane Debe Tsutumba means to pretend to reach your final nirvana. In other words, you have to hang out there until the last being in the universe reaches enlightenment. That's your, what do they call it? Duration. Okay, that's how long you're there. Last quality of, this, of the Lonku, the Sambhogakaya, is its chu. It's 
say ch. Ch. Ch means uh, dharma, and uh, the only thing people talk about in that Buddha paradise is 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 compassion and wisdom. I mean, the, it's fixed. The only stuff that anyone ever I mean, if there was a New York Times, it would be you know. Compassion today, or <laughs> you know, <laughs> wisdom today, or you know, there isn't anything else in the newspaper. It's just everyone's talking about how to prevent suffering for people, how to love people, how to how to get compassion from people. Uh, what's the best way to save this person or that person? What's the best way to fight anger, jealousy, desire? You know, it's the only thing they talk about. There's nothing else there. They that's all they talk about is these high, holy things all the time. And this is the, 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 the Dharma there, what they teach there is fixed. It's all Mahayana, it's all high teachings about compassion and love. That's all they feel like talking about. And that's fixed. So those are five qualities of, of a Buddha paradise. That's actually what you're trying to achieve, is a place like that. And that should be in the back of your mind, is a, is a place like that. Now, now whether it's possible, we'll talk about later. But that's the way it's supposed to be, okay? Uh, not like everyone sitting around calm, getting old, you know? Not like that. That's not what Dharma's for. That's not what Buddhism's for, okay? <coughs> Those are the qualities of, of the first part of a Buddha. There are four parts of a Buddha, okay? They call them the four bodies. I think it's a little confusing because you feel like, you know, it'd be hard to buy pants for four bodies, you know? <laughs> okay. Uh, tuku. Say tuku. 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 Um, this is what you hear tulku or talku or talku. Or this is real. The real meaning of it is tuku. Tuku. Tul means to send out an emanation, uh, send out a projection. It's like a movie. You know, like the Buddha has this ability to send out pictures of himself or herself. So the Buddha's main body, her body or his body, is sitting in that Buddha paradise surrounded by these other beings, holy beings, talking these holy things, hanging out until the last suffering being is, is liberated. And in the meantime, they are sending these uh, bodies all over the universe to act out things on different planets. You know, like if someone needs a dog, you know, someone's lonely and needs a nice dog, you know, they uh, send this, they could emanate as a dog, you know, no problem. Uh, they could emanate as a bridge, as an overpass. They can emanate as a wave in the ocean. They can emanate as a f friend. And it's, it's sort of a nice exercise. If you do Donglen, if you do some compassion meditations, you actually visualize doing this. You know, like anything anyone needs. Need a girlfriend? I'll be a girlfriend today. Need a husband? I'll be a husband today. Need a dog? I'll be a dog today. You know, need a new overpass uh, over the... George Washington Bridge, just prevent all that traffic, I'll be done, you know. And, and just emanating as all these different beings and objects. And this is a quality of a Buddha. Each one of those emanations is called a tuku. There's one called Chokituku, which is the ultimate tuku, which appears on a planet. And that's the Buddha that you see, you know. That's the classic uh, Buddha that, something like that, you know. That's the, the one that appeared on this planet 2,500 years ago. That's called like Coke classic, like Buddha classic, you know? <laughs> That's, uh, it's 80, it's 32 minor marks, 80 major, uh, 32 major marks, 80 minor marks. Certain classic shape, classic ears, classic eyes, classic mouth, classic everything. And that's called Chokituku. That's called the, the classic emanation. But they also have billions and billions of other emanations going on at the same time. Uh, this body you don't get until a millisecond after you get enlightened because uh, it takes like an enlightened mind to send out these bodies. So they say there's always a time lag of a millisecond after enlightenment. You start out enlightened, you only have three parts. Next millisecond, you have four parts for eternity. Okay, and that's, that's out there. The other neat thing about this body is that you don't have to think about it. It just happens. It's called hungidupa, thundup. Thundup means uh, spontaneous. It just, if somebody, is ready on planet Earth to hear one sentence of Dharma, 
from somebody and they happen to be on the number 14 bus going down Church Street, you know, this person will get on the bus and that will be an emanation of a Buddha. And, and the Buddha doesn't have to think, you know, oh, I got to catch the 14 bus, you know, so and so is ready to hear a line of Dharma, you know. <laughs> it's just lundrup. Lundrup means spontaneously this being appears, uh, sits down next to them, could look like some big lady is crunching them in the side, <laughs> and then does, says some comment offhand that they go home and they think about it and they got a great Dharma teaching. Don't think Dharma teachings happen like this. I mean, 99% of Dharma teachings are happening in your office. God knows how many of them are tukus. Okay? You don't know. You really don't know. You've got to be very careful, you know? <laughs> uh, so, really, seriously, they have millions of years to plan it. You know, don't think they, they're wimpy, you know? I mean, they have millions of years. Of, they can think ahead a million years to plan something for you. They can think ahead a million years to put somebody on the number four, stand there for half an hour, even if it's late. And they know it's going to be late. And they know, you know, the person's going to step up with the left foot on the bus and, and swing their umbrella a certain way and hit somebody with a package. And it's all planned. It's like planned a million years ahead of time. It's no problem for a tuku. And they have been enlightened millions million years of years ago. It's, it's absolutely no problem. They, they have the absolute capacity to do that. And that's called Hungadrupa. It's one of the ways of a Buddha. It's part of the physical body of a Buddha is that they have this ability to just be there when the conditions are right and they'll be there, okay? And that's, that's Tuku, okay? Now, Tuku has come to be a name in Tibetan Buddhism for lamas who have, who have re, re, reincarnated, you know? They're called Tukus, uh, in the belief that they're actually Buddhists taking on a new, a new, a new image. So Lama Sufa is a Tuku, for example, okay? Uh, the, the next part of a Buddha is Say Yeshi? Yeshi. Chuku. Chuku. Yeshi? Yeshi. Chuku. Chuku. Uh, yeshi means wisdom, and Chuku means like Dharmakaya. It's like one of the parts of a Buddha. It's basically their omniscience, okay? It's their ability to know all things. And at, at any given moment, a Buddha is able to know everything in the universe at one moment. Everything that ever will be, everything that ever was, everything that's happening in the whole universe at the same moment, Everything that anyone's thinking, anything that anyone ever will think, anything that anyone ever would have thought or did think, and they perceive it all in the same instant. In one instant, they can perceive everything in the universe. You know, are they so? They're therefore they're omniscient. Okay, they know all things. They can put their mind anywhere in the universe. They know your deepest thoughts a million years ago. You can't hide anything from a Buddha. By the way, that makes it cool. If you want to invite a Buddha to your room, you just you know, you just think, you know, <laughs> please come, you know, and they're there, okay? And, and also that you can have this sort of trust or surrender for them. You know, you can, you, can, you can trust in them. You know, they know exactly what you're thinking, and they knew it a million years ago. And, and you can just put yourself in their hands. They know everything that's going to happen. And they, and they also have this other quality of total love for you. This is part of Yeshichuku, you know. It, they say it wouldn't help if they knew everything if they didn't care. You know, so who cares if they know everything if they don't care about you? But they say they have more love for you than you could ever have for yourself. So, so it's this cool combination of someone who, who knows all the lottery numbers and wants to help everybody, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like some kind of fantastic combination of someone who, who knows everything and all they want to do in their life is to help you. They would, they would die for you. Easily they would die for you. M more than you would die for you. Uh, just to make you happy in the lightest, smallest way, they would, they would do anything for you. And, and that's the quality of Yoshi Chuku. This is, and it takes, it takes a long time to reach that. It takes a lot of practice to reach that. You can. Each person in this room can, can do it. So, so far you have three parts of this Buddha, right? It's very interesting. You have a body that's hanging out in your own Buddha paradise. And that Buddha paradise has all these characteristics. And that body is totally different. I mean, I think the most important thing is the body is different. The body has its own extraordinary qualities. And then you have this ability, 
without thinking about it, to show up on a billion different planets at one time in any way that anyone wants, okay? Anything that they want that's not non-virtuous, okay? I mean, something that would be beneficial for them. You can show up there automatically, spontaneously. And then the third quality is that you have this total love for beings, absolute, total, engrossed in, in love for them, and then you know everything in the universe at one moment. So this is what you're headed for. This is what you want. This is what a Buddha is, okay? There's one more part. Should do it now or later? Eh, we'll do it now. This is why you come to a class. This is why you join a center. This one right here? Okay. Put it on the other Okay. Thank you. Is that all right? Sorry, it's not bigger. Say no. No. Niku. No. No. Niku. This one's tough, okay? This one's tough. Um, this is the emptiness of the Buddha's mind and body. It's the emptiness of the other three parts. Now that's very mystical, you know? And uh, you have to understand it. You have to learn about it, okay? Um, it's very important. Mm. What does the emptiness of the other three parts mean? Like, let's say, my physical body right now. What's the emptiness of this body, okay? And, and that's very, very important, okay? The emptiness of this body that I have now is what makes it possible for me to become a Buddha. If this arm was not empty, it, I could not become a Buddha. Okay, and it's very interesting. If you don't get it, at some point, you have to get it. Uh, you'll never be able to be, reach enlightenment. Impossible, totally impossible. At some point, you have to understand why the emptiness of this arm allows me to become a Buddha. And that, that by the way, will be the emptiness of my Buddha's body. Okay, like that emptiness you can take to the bank, meaning that part of you will be exactly the same when you become a Buddha. Will my body be the same when I get enlightened? Will my body be like this with all these weird hairs and stuff? <laughs> no, no, okay. No, it'll be made of light, right? And will my mind be the same, you know, with all this crammed chock full of jealousy and pride and arrogance and everything else? Will it be the same? No, obviously, hopefully not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Hoping for some progress there. You know, like, it'll be totally different. Totally, totally different frame of mind. Totally, totally different kind of mind. But there's one thing about Michael Roach now that will be the same. That's the emptiness of my body and the emptiness of my mind. So, so that you have to study. That you have to understand. Because if you don't understand about that emptiness, you can't become a Buddha. Uh, you have to understand the emptiness of your arm. And that's, that's something very subtle. And here you can go back to the office, and I apologize to all the people who have heard this a thousand times, okay, but it's on my mind all the time. Uh, I, have, I have two bosses. It's a, it's a privately owned company. They, they're a man and a wife. They own all the stock, you know. And uh, they're both crazy, but um, <laughs> one, one is, I won't say which one. <laughs> one is worse than the other, okay, in my mind. So uh, there's always this example I give that I'm sitting there in my office. You know, I, we work in benches. The diamond business, when you have a large diamond company, you have these long benches and you have diamonds all over the table. And uh, there's these long rows and people are picking them up with tweezers and, and chucking them and throwing them into these boxes, you know, like good or quality B, quality C, quality D, and you're just like, you're going like, like this, you know, and, uh, and then they, they come in, you know, when somebody comes in, you all look up because your eyes are really tired and you're really bored and, and uh, you hear something at the door, you know, and the boss bursts in, you know. My boss is very brusque and so he bursts in, you know, and he'll, he'll come over to my bench, you know, and he'll stand in front of me and he'll say, you screwed up the JCPenney order, you know, he'll scream at me, you know, and he'll, he'll say, you're the one who did it, you know, and I'll say, 
I'm like that, and the whole room is suddenly quiet, you know, and everybody's like, there's 20 people on this long line, and they're all like looking at him, you know, and, and, uh, and you have to picture your boss at that moment. Like, you, you have the same thing. I've, I've learned that everyone has the same boss. They just come in a different, they have a different tuku, right? <laughs> all these boss tukus, right? Same essence, different form. Uh, but they're standing there, and they're, and they're standing in front of you, and they, and they, I don't know about you, but I don't know what it is. I think when somebody is in a position to decide your pay and your future and all your salary and your bonuses, and then um, they take on this ability to irritate you. You know, I don't know what it is. Like, or maybe it's because you have to put up with it. You know, like you're under a blackmail. It's a blackmail situation, you know. You have to stay there. You can't just walk up and say, you're not my friend anymore, you're so stupid. You know, you, you have to... <laughs> You have to stay there and you have to take it from them, you know, because they're, they're paying the mortgage, they're feeding your kids, you know. So you have to stay there. And then, therefore, you get this sensitivity towards them where you actually, they can irritate you more than anybody because you can't leave. You have to take it. You have to sit there. I mean, you can do all these little employee things like, you know, say something back or, you know, but there's not much you can do. They're, they're in control and you know it and it irritates you. And so, and so they scream at you, they say something to you. And then in Buddhism we say, is that screaming self-existent? You know, does that screaming have any essence? And that's where you get into emptiness. Okay? Either the screaming is coming from his side, self-existent, or the screaming is empty. That all sounds very weird, but I'll, I'll, I'll make it more concrete. There's this guy sitting next to me who doesn't like me very much, okay? Because I'm always on the phone with my students and stuff. And he has to do all the extra work that I don't do. <laughs> and uh, so when the boss comes in and screams at me, he actually perceives that same incident as something nice. <laughs> you know, like, like for me it's a painful incident, and for him it's a pleasant incident. One, the same incident is simultaneously pleasant and unpleasant. And then there's this lady, she's a Tibetan lady that I hired like uh, 10 years ago, named Doma. And she's she doesn't much care about all this office politics stuff. She's just neutral. So you have three people sitting. We actually sit next to each other. Just one, two, three people. And, and it's always the same. You know, I'm getting yelled at. This guy's enjoying it. And she could care less. She's just hoping the boss leaves, you know, because she's trying to get her work done. So you have, like, unpleasant, pleasant, and neutral in the same row. And there was only one incident, okay? There's only one boss, like the boss. The boss is simultaneously being totally pleasant, totally unpleasant, and totally neutral. And that's, in to Buddhism, that's considered very, very profound. You know, the fact that one guy, at one moment, can have, <coughs> can have three separate qualities that are contradictory. It's like saying, this wall could be all red, and all blue, and all yellow at the same time. Like, can it? Can it? No, it's impossible. I mean, if I say, you know, green meaning blue and yellow mixed together, but I'm not saying that. All pure 100% blue, or all pure 100% yellow, or all pure 100% red, can it be any one of the, in, any combination of those at the same moment? Cannot. And if you think about it, he cannot be totally pleasant, totally unpleasant, and neutral at the same time. He, he can't be from his side. Right? Like there must be, there's something from coming from his side. You know, he's, he's, there's this red, uh, <laughs> you know, there's this red circle opening up on this, on this flesh colored thing. And there's certain noises coming out of this opening. You know, there's syllables coming out. And then one person interprets them as pleasant. Oh, Michael Roche is finally getting it. You know, I've been waiting for this, you know. And then I'm like, you know, oh, he's so unfair, you know, I'm so busy, I'm so bodhisattva, I'm doing all this stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and then the, the, the third person is like, I wish they would stop this, they do this every day, you know. <laughs> and, uh, really, it's really like that. So, so can he be, from his side, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral at the same time? Total, purely blue, red, and yellow at the same time. Cannot be. <coughs> Cannot be. That's very, very profound. That's very, very profound. That's very deep. I mean, he, he can't be pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral at the same time. He cannot be, because those are n opposites. You can't be an all-nice guy and all-bad guy at the same time. It's impossible. 
but I see him as an all bad guy at that moment. And he sees him as an all good guy at that moment. And she sees him as all neutral at that moment. But he can't be all three. He can't even be any two. Because they're opposites. That's what opposite means. He can't be an all nice guy and all bad guy at the same moment. It's impossible. So is he. So is he. Seems to be. I don't know. Huh? Is he? Can't be. Can't be. But each person is seeing that. Right? I mean, each person is seeing, one person sees all pleasant, one, well, believe me, all unpleasant for me. And then all neutral for the third person. We each see that. We honestly, truly see that. Is that wrong? Do we see a wrong thing? Is he pleasant to the other guy? Yeah. Let's start like that. Yeah. He is. Trust me. Because <laughs> when he gets yelled at, I ain't got this. Anymore, you know? <laughs> right? And, and is he really unpleasant to me? You can't say he's not. You can't say like I'm crazy. You can't say one of us is crazy. You know, really he does seem pleasant to him, and really he does seem unpleasant to me. But he can't be both. So which one is he? This is, by the way, Majimika. If you want Majimika, you don't have to read all these 16,000 pages in the Kangyur and that. This is it. This is the big question. This is Nagarjuna's big question, you know. Which one is he? Depends on the perceiver. Yeah, it depends on the perceiver. Okay, it really depends on the perceiver. But, but which one is he really? <laughs> trick question, okay? <laughs> which one is he really? The really is the trick, right? In Majimika, you've got to watch out for the word really. Right. Which one is he really? Well, that's even a fourth perspective, right? But let's, let's leave that alone, because that makes it complicated, really complicated. Let's just say, which one is he really? He's got to be one of them, because there's three people who are not crazy. We call pramana, tsema. Three people are having tsemas. Tsema means undeniably valid perception. You know, I am having a valid perception. He is screaming at me. He is angry. It is unpleasant. Don't tell me, it's a, don't tell me I'm crazy. I'm not crazy. I didn't take LSD before I went to work. <laughs> you know, maybe I should have. I don't know. But uh, I'm having a normal perception. He's having a normal perception. And she's having a normal perception. They're not, we're not drunk, we're not crazy, we're not under the violent uh, effect of some emotion like anger where you can't see anything straight. We're just normal people having a normal perception of this normal guy, and they're contradictory. So which one is right? They can't all be right, because he cannot be two opposite things at the same time. But isn't the anger <laughs> is directed towards you? Yeah. They, they are experiencing a secondary level. But the fact of the matter is, if he was yelling at your partner, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, it would be a different type of experience there. Okay? So the relationship between the two of you, there's something very specific there, and the other was a secondary, and that's another variable in that. So mine is mostly right, and theirs is partly right? Th theirs is, yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Come on, three people are having their hearts beat for different reasons, you know? You know, I'm going ba dunk 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 I get nervous when he yells at me. I'm like, ee. and the other one's like, ee. <laughs> you know, you know. no, it, it can't be that he's not, because he's eliciting three real emotions. So he's functioning. We say anything in Buddhism, dunjin nupang upatini, anything which is functioning is real. You know, he is producing an effect in three different people. So he's real. Yeah. You could say that, okay? I guess that's the punchline. Okay, like he's, that's what emptiness means. That's the emptiness of my boss. By the way, there's no more complicated thing about emptiness than that. You can try to visualize black or green or fluorescent or, it doesn't mean that. Emptiness is the simple fact that he's not any one of those three by himself, period. That's all there is. He's not any one of those three by himself. By himself is inherently existing, whatever you want to say. You can say by himself and life would be a lot easier, right? By himself, <laughs> he's not any one of those three. Really, he's not. It, it's coming from, from each person in the room. Obviously, clearly, if I lead you up to it this way, you have to agree that it's three different people, you know, kind of projecting three different things onto him for their own reasons, right? I mean, there's, there's 
there's functionality here going on. I ain't going to get a raise from this guy. <laughs> there's something important going on here. You know, I'm projecting on him mean boss. This guy's projecting on him nice boss, righteous boss. <laughs> you know, and, and this guy, this lady's saying, I Not wish he would boss. be a quiet boss. <laughs> yeah, 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 loud boss. Bother, bothersome boss. You know, each one of them is, is projecting onto him a different thing. Why? See, that Buddhism goes down to that. Buddhism goes down to that. Why am I seeing him as an unpleasant boss? Where do the unpleasant things of the world come from? Where do the pleasant things of the world come from? And where do the neutral things in the world come from? Because everything in the world is one or the other. Every experience in your life is one or the other. Until you get to your Buddha paradise when everything is equally blissful, right? Until that time, you got this terrible mix, you know? This up and down, <laughs> up and down, constant flow, you know? Seems nice for a while, gets lousy. Seems lousy, gets nice. Seems great, turns into neutral. Nothing stays the same. Until you reach a Buddha paradise, it's all floating between those three. Totally floating between those three. But why? You know, why didn't he yell at my partner that day? <laughs> yeah, she says, because I messed up the penny account. But, but see, Buddhism, it's very interesting. Buddhism says, but why? Why me? No, but why wasn't I one paying attention? But why was I doing something else? You see, no, it's a child's question. Buddhism asks the child's question. Buddhism says, why me? You know, why? Why was, I pe why was my student calling me? Why did he catch me and not that guy? You know, his friends are calling him all day too. But why did he catch me? You know? Karma. Yeah. Karma. So where does karma come from? Where does it stay? How does it happen? You know, we got to talk about that. I think take a break first, okay? It's kind of hot. Take a break, stretch, walk around, come back in 10 minutes, okay? And we'll see if there's an answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Is the body that just appears wherever it's needed. And then obviously you have to have uh, total compassion and total enlightenment. And those are obvious parts of a Buddha. But we were wondering, you know, what's the function of the emptiness of a Buddha? Why is, why is the emptiness of the Buddha's body and mind get to be a whole separate part of the Buddha? Why do they say there's four parts of the Buddha? Why, does, why is the emptiness of the Buddha so important? And, and that's really the, the, the key to why, how can this body change to the other body? And that's the point. I mean, everybody in this room, sooner or later, is going to be very interested in this question. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you're not yet, don't worry, those little cells are working inside of you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Seriously, probably in each one of us there's some cancer cells starting to form or, you know, probably uh, in all of us or some kind of problem forming. You know, it's, we don't know it yet. Each one of us has something inside of us, no doubt, no question. You know, maybe it's latent or whatever, but it's working. It started already working, no doubt, there's something, and it will kill you. Uh, so how do... How to change this body into the other body? And the key is the emptiness, okay? Do I like this body or not? Does the body seem nice to me, pleasant or unpleasant? On the whole. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You're obviously in a different body. <laughs> I mean, mostly, I don't know what. But anyway, it is getting unpleasant, right? I mean, it's getting worse and worse. I mean, I wish I had the 20-year-old body. It was a lot nicer. Okay, I mean, right? So, I mean, it is getting worse and worse. It really is getting worse and worse. And, and according to Buddhism, that's unpleasant. And by definition, anything that's unpleasant came from bad karma. Okay, anything that's unpleasant comes from bad karma. The definition of bad karma is Rangi Namigi Debu, Yidu Mi Oon Depena Migewa. It's bad karma. The definition of bad karma. It gives a bad result. It gives you a suffering result. And you can switch it around. Anything that's suffering came from bad karma. What's bad karma? Suffering. No, what's the definition of bad karma? Anything you do in your speech, or your body, or your mind, which hurts another person. That's the root text. I mean, what, anything that does harm to another person is bad karma. What's the result of that? You have suffering. You will have suffering. What's the converse of that? Anytime you have suffering, it's because you hurt somebody else. Period. So if your body is unpleasant, it's because you hurt somebody else. If I, if 
me instead of the other guy, it has to be because I hurt someone before, according to Buddhism. It's the only, it's the only answer. Now, how does that work, and is that just some explanation that they made up because it explains why this crazy world is so crazy, you know? Not at all. I mean, and you have to study that. It takes a long time to study that, but basically, an imprint is made on your mind when you hurt someone. Karma has an imprint on your mind. Does, does Western science accept imprints on the mind? Did you send your kids to grade school? <laughs> Why? <laughs> You're hoping that the imprint made in first grade will last till third grade, right? I mean, you do believe in imprints. Seriously. You know, obviously. And you believe in a mental continuum. You believe that the mind that exists in the first grade will still be there in the third grade. And you obviously accept that whatever's imprinted in the mind in the first grade will still be in the mind, or some of it, by the third grade, <laughs> okay? You believe that, or you wouldn't send children to school. You believe that. It's not like this is some Asian idea, you know? It's not like that. You believe that imprints can be made on the mind, and you believe that they are stored in the mind, and you believe that they are carried on. How are they carried on is very interesting, but they replicate from moment to moment. According to Buddhism, they're destroyed instant by instant. You know, the, the imprint for ABC in the first grade lasts until the third grade. But it's, it's, it's like that. It's being destroyed by the moment, and there's some kind of impetus that's carrying it to the third grade. And the same with any kind of imprint on your mind. Anytime you say something mean to someone, anytime you do something to hurt someone, anytime you even just have a negative thought towards someone, an imprint is made on your mind. Later, it it ripens, and you see some kind of suffering. For whom? <laughs> you, you know? <laughs> For you. you know? And that's where the world comes from. Lele Jigden, fourth chapter, Abhidharma Kosh. We're going to talk about it at Vajapani for a whole week. It says, Lele Jigden, that's okay. The whole world, your entire world, and every detail of this world, every light in San Francisco, for you, came from something you did before. Everything is, is imprints on your mind that are that are ripening in your mind. and on, on Your whole world is just these imprints ripening in your mind. We say 65 per, per second. They're, they're ripening at a rate of 65 per second. You know, this is 16 centuries ago they figured this out, right? And it looks, it's like a movie. And the frames are moving so fast that you think it's, it's called what? Your life. <laughs> you know? It's not. It's just a bunch of imprints ripening. <laughs> at the rate of 65 per second. And it gives you the impression of motion. It gives you the impression of a lifetime. It gives you the impression that you're walking around. But really it's just these imprints just ripening in your mind like that fast. And it gives you the impression of life. And, and all the negative things that happen to you are these imprints going off in your mind uh, that were planted there when you did or said or even thought anything. Minor things. Very powerful, extremely powerful. And running your world, that's why three different people sitting in three different chairs at the same desk can focus on the same external object and, see, and have three totally different experiences. Why? It's not coming from him. We proved he couldn't be those three things. We proved it. It's coming from those three people. And why? Because this person said something mean to someone in the past. And that imprint is going off in their mind, and they're, they're actually creating this interpretation of the boss as unpleasant. He's interpreting the same thing as pleasant, and she's interpreting the same object as neutral. So don't tell me it's coming from him. That's self-existence. You know, it's not coming from him. It's coming from three different people's minds. What's that got to do with this last body of the Buddha? My, this, this arm is the same. My arm is the same. Very interesting. The arm is the same as the boss. You know, this, seriously, it's the same as the boss. Your arm is the same as your boss, really, seriously. I mean, the, the boss is a stupid little silly example. But we're talking reality. You know, this, this stuff could have been pure white light uh, of an angel's arm. And I could look down and, and see it and never see it get old like that. So what's, what would make it happen? That's all we have to talk about. Then we can go home. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's all we have to talk about. That's the bottom line, right? Yeah. Really, that's the bottom line. If if I can, if we can describe some kind of thing that you can talk about in one hour that's logical, that would make this arm appear as a, as a, as that kind of arm, instead of getting older and older and uglier and uglier, 
and more and more wrinkled, then, then bonier, you know, then what would make it happen? Freeway. Uh, okay, go ahead. That's a lot. <laughs> no, go ahead. Mine was a joke. Okay. It was freeway. Uh, I didn't catch it. It was a Uh, how to make it turn into light. I mean, by the way, if it looks attractive to me now, it's because I did something good for someone. And if it gets older and uglier, it's because that good karma is wearing off. Aging is the process of good karma wearing out. You know, it's just wearing out. I'm using it up. Every time I have an arm, every five minutes I have an arm that I like, it's 65 times 60 times 5. Seriously, karmas I just blew. It's very expensive to have an arm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> seriously, no kidding. To maintain, this is like computing power if you know computers, you know. Like how many megabytes of data would it take to, to keep a movie going for 10 minutes? We did it with my Lama. We had him do these mudras. It, it's a one minute clip. It took like 20 megabytes. And it's 20 million <coughs> dot, dots on a screen. And, and karma is the same. It means it's 65 times 60 times 5 karmas, discrete, separate good deeds I did have to play back for me to see an arm for five minutes. Seriously. It's, it's very expensive. Um, and that's why people die. Because it wears out. It's, it's very costly to have an arm. You know, and that's, that's why you die. Seriously. The, the mind stops playing arm because there's no more good karma. And you see it get old. And you see it die. Uh, it's, it's, it's very scary. So, so what can I do to make it, make it an angel's arm? And then we can go home and just go do it, right? It's 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 dharma practice. I mean, it's good karma. It's helping other people. That? No, that's what I'm saying. It's obviously not enough to stop the aging of my arm. You know, Master Shanti Deva. There's this famous line. We did it last week. You know, somebody said, "I don't see what good helping other people is. I haven't seen any change in my arm at all." <laughs> you know. <laughs> And Master Shanti Deva says, that proves you haven't done, I almost said a bad word. <laughs> it proves you haven't done anything, you know. It proves you're not doing anything. Don't tell me it's not happening. You did it and it's not happening. What you should be saying is that because your arm's sitting there and getting old at the same old rate, that proves your Dharma practice stinks, <laughs> you know. Uh, and that's, that's all I have to say tonight, really. If, if, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> No, I'm, ser I'm very serious. I'm dead serious. If, if I I it's either a question of information, like you don't have enough information to do the right things, or laziness, you know, or you're just not doing it. You know what to do and you're not doing it. But, but it's only one of the two. You know, the information is there. The Dharma is there. Really, the practices are there. The practices to turn this arm into a, a, an angel's arm of light are all there. If you just did it, you would, you would see. It would start. Did you ever see anyone's arm turn into light? No. So that proves it doesn't exist, right? No. And my boss should be unfriendly to all three people, right? <laughs> Seriously, think about it. Does it prove anything to say you haven't seen anyone's body turn into pure light recently? No. Why not? If you're being wimpy in your practice, if your practice stinks, then by definition you wouldn't see it. You couldn't see it. Does that mean they can't see it? No. No. That's the emptiness of your arm. By the way, that's Gohan Yiku. That's the beauty of the emptiness of the Buddha. That's why the emptiness of the Buddha is important. I'll go over it again. My arm is empty, which means it can be anything depending on what I'm projecting onto it. You know, the same way my boss. The boss is exactly the same. The arm is the same. It doesn't if I had enough goodness in my mind, I would be seeing an angel's arm. And at the same time, you might be seeing what? This normal old American guy with bony arm, getting all hairy, wrinkled, all these warts on here, you know. I mean, you could be seeing the same thing exactly. You could be seeing that, and I could be seeing something totally different. No problem. That's the emptiness of your arm. The emptiness of your arm allows you to become enlightened. That's why the, this is called the essence body. Ngonyiku means the emptiness body. The emptiness body of a Buddha means the Buddha and you and me, we don't have any inherent nature. 
it, it could have been any way at all. If I was good enough, I would see my boss every day as, uh, well, let's not go so far. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know my boss. No, <laughs> no but, but I could see him come in every day and say, oh, you know, another great job. You know, the order went out on time. Have another 15% raise. Take a month off to a retreat. You know, uh, I could see that every day if I had enough good karma. If I had, uh, if I had much more good karma, I might actually see a tantric deity walk in. By the way, if you haven't seen a tantric deity, that proves what? Seriously, very seriously. You practice things. You know, very, very seriously. Chanti Deva is very adamant. He says, Kelte Dinde Nekam Jurum Misi. You know, if you, if you had been practicing well, you would already be there. Because you're not there, I don't, you don't have to tell me about your practice. I know your practice stinks. You know? Now, what does it mean when you say your practice stinks? You know? Does that mean you have to rush home and sit down on that cushion and, and you know, go like this? Shanti Day doesn't, doesn't say that. He's, he doesn't say anything like that. He says, go, go out and treat yourself and others the same. That's all he says. He says, go out and treat yourself and other people the same. What's that mean? Well, I mean, think about it. Treat yourself and other people exactly the same. Like if, if you're standing there and five other people are standing there and you're all hungry the same, then feed them all the same. Because why do you treat yourself different from others? You know, why do you feed yourself and you don't feed the other four? It doesn't make sense. And until you do that, you'll always be, be li you'll never change. You'll always be like that. He says, until you can treat other people exactly the same as you, Democratic, right? We are Americans, right? We believe in that. You know, and it's very profound, it's very difficult. You know, until you can be in a room and there's, there's four people who need a, a, a Coke and you have one Coke and until and you would give it to them as easily as you would give it to this, this body, then, then you'll never get there. It says it won't happen. You'll never see, you'll never see it happen. It's very, very... Uh, it's very interesting. Until you can treat other people the same as, with the same concern that you treat your own body, you'll never see those things. You'll always be like this. It's, and, it, and conversely, if you start working at it, you, can, you will start to see those things. You know, it's very cool. It's not like you have to go home and memorize uh, 30,000 pages of these weird tantric things and you have to ring the bell the right way and if you don't ring it the right way, you don't get it, you know. It's not like that. It's just, all he says is, treat other people the way you treat yourself and sit back and enjoy the fireworks, you know. And, and, your, and your arm will start to change, you know. And it's cool. It's really cool. I mean, and then he, say, he gives some very good advice. He says, uh, between you and me, start small. You know, he says, start with uh, vegetables. What's that verse going? Anybody memorize it? You're supposed to memorize it, right? No? Okay, later. Anyway, it's about carrots and potatoes. He says, starts with carrots and potatoes. The, like, you don't have to give away your house or anything. He says, you know, sit down with somebody at lunch, split your dessert with them. You know, just split your ice cream with them or something. Starts, he says, starts, start at your level, which is splitting your ice cream. You don't have to give away all your money or anything. You know, start, start treating them the same way you would treat yourself. And he says, if you keep that up over a long enough period of time, then it won't be difficult for you later to do these extraordinary things. But if you start out trying to do these big things, you'll just fail, and you'll give up. So you start with little things. You know, start with tiny little things that you can manage. You know, like share your ice cream with somebody, and, and treat them as if they had as much right to your bowl of ice cream as you have. And, and if you can do that once, you can do it twice. And if you do it twice, you can do it three times. And then it starts to get a habit with your ice cream. And then naturally you move up to your hamburger, you know? <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Seriously. And he's very adamant. He's, he's the master of this bodhisattva thinking, right? And he says, don't, don't go out and, you know, give away all your dinner, you know? Start with a few pieces of your ice cream. And just start exactly on that level. Start tonight with one other person. Don't tell them. And... And treat them the same way you treat yourself. Pretend that you are them. And then some guy comes up to Shanti Dev and says, But you're stupid. I don't feel his pain, but I feel my pain. You know, he says, when I, get, when I get hungry, I feel it. 
you know. But when he gets hungry, I don't feel it. So why should I treat him the same as me? You know, there's a reason why I always pour my ice cream first. It's because I can't taste it when he sticks a spoon in his mouth. <laughs> you know, he says, you know, it sounds great, but it, that ain't the way it works. You know, when I, when I stick a spoon of ice cream in his mouth, I don't get any charge out of it. And when, when, when I stick it in my mouth, I get a charge out of it. So why should I make sure that he's not hungry, the same way I make sure that I'm not hungry, because I can't feel his hunger. And then Master Shanti Deva says, he, it's very beautiful, he says, I agree. You know, I, by the way, Bodhisattva activity is not aimed at getting to the point where you can feel him hungry, because you can't. Why? It's his karma. He's projecting it. It's like, am I going to see the boss bad for you? I can't, because I'll see him exactly my, how my karma tells me to see him. I can't feel your hunger. I, I actually can't do it. You know, I, I can imagine it, or I can wish I could feel it, but I can't. If I don't have the karma to be hungry, I can't feel your hunger. So Shanti Deva says, I'm not talking about that. I agree with you. I can't make you... There's no Buddhist practice. You don't go and meditate for an hour or a day or a month to try to feel other people's pain. So when the doctor sticks a needle in him, you go, ouch, you know? It, it doesn't work like that. You can't do it. You have never met anyone who could do that, and you can't do it. But he says, but you can make a decision that their pain is un as unacceptable as yours is. And he, that's the point, he says. You can decide that this person's pain is as unacceptable as my pain is. And on that basis, you can you can treat them the same as you. You know, when there's only this much ice cream, and there's two of you, and there's only one bowl, you know, on the basis that their deprivation of Ben and Jerry's is unacceptable, you know, <laughs> you, you determine that you will split the ice cream with them. That's, you can do that. You know, he says, that's, that's what we mean when we say treat them the same. He says, I agree that you can't feel their pain. But that doesn't prove anything. You decide what's acceptable. Just decide it's unacceptable. Mothers decide it's unacceptable for their children to suffer. So why don't they decide that other people's children shouldn't suffer? It's just a decision. It's arbitrary. It's really arbitrary. They can't feel their children's hunger any more than they can feel other people's children's hunger. But they decide that they're going to take care of their children's hunger. It's just a decision. So Shantideva says, go ahead, change it. Why? If you want to see this as like that, you have to do that. It's, it's quite simple. And you never will. You'll never know what you miss. That's the interesting thing. You know, you'll never know what you miss. Just try it. You know, try it for like, give it a month or two months, you know. Seriously. You know, just try it. You never tried it. You know, seriously try to put yourself in another person's shoes and say, what would they like at this moment, you know? What, what would they like to happen right now? You know, like put yourself totally in their shoes and treat them the same as you and see what happens in a month or two months. See if anything changes, like a little bit of light shows up, you know. <laughs> By the way, would it be gradual or sudden? What do you guess? <laughs> Seriously. It'll be, it's gradual. It's very gradual. So if we have a defective body, flesh and bone, and we're an unenlightened being and we suddenly achieve enlightenment. I yeah. mean, there is a sudden achievement of enlightenment, right? <coughs> well, no. I mean, yeah. <laughs> no, it takes a long, long time. I mean, the Buddha took yeah. 75, 76, 77 thousand kalpas, 10 to the 6th power, 10, 60th power, 10 with 60 zeros, years. It's very gradual. <laughs> but, I mean, at that stage where you attain a Buddha body, yeah. though, the, yeah. the Sambhogakaya, yeah. do you recognize this defective body as a tukul cool at that point, as an emanation body? You're, you're asking me something very... Catch this. Catch this. If I change my karma, does the irritating boss become a nice boss? Or is he a nice boss? You see what I mean? You're positing a self-existent samsaric body. It's very tricky. It's very greasy. It's very like a slit. What do you call it? A greased pig. Self-existent things are like greased pigs. The minute you think you're not thinking of it that way, you're thinking of it that way. <laughs> what you're asking me is something impossible. Did my irritating boss 
become a nice boss. No. What happened? My karma straightened out. He didn't change. He's always been nothing. <laughs> seriously, very seriously. If you gotta, you gotta catch this greased pig. Shunyata is like a greased pig, you know. Every time you think you got it, it's like getting away again. Um, maybe I'm still on the same tangent. Yeah. I mean, at the point where you do achieve that enlightenment, though. Yeah. You have a at the point at which you see yourself achieve that okay. enlightenment. Uh, <laughs> you never take on this defective body again, right? I not mean, at all. This defective body would never not ever. Be, do you only by choice then have a defective body? Or? You never have by choice. They they can, if it's useful for some other being on some planet who's in pain, they can, they don't even think about it, you see, it's just spontaneous. They appear as a, as a person, but they're not a real person, and that person's not suffering. So it's, it's impossible for a Buddha, if a Buddha wanted to suffer, they couldn't suffer. You see what I mean? They can't do it. They don't have the karma to do it. We'll just open up for questions, if anybody has questions. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, it's not like, yeah, you shouldn't do that. Yeah. Well, I, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I'm just wondering if that creates further bad karma, you know, if you don't eat well, if you don't exercise, if you smoke and drink and intentionally or whatever, keep attracting the wrong people into your life, and, and yeah. you know, rather than supportive people. And does that further compound the karma? The, the desire to hurt yourself, like suicide. Uh, or, well, let's take it to an extreme, because the others are just versions, right? <laughs> Suicide is, uh, is, the, is the first, it's the same as killing another person. Ac ac absolutely the same karma. Uh, Buddhism doesn't distinguish between killing yourself or killing someone else. So abusing yourself and abusing other people is exactly the same karma. Probably more serious to abuse yourself. And in the highest teachings, it's a serious bad deed to do any kind of permanent damage to your body. Like to, to, to hurt your body, especially out of spiritual blah blah, you know, like to, to starve yourself or to hurt your body is considered a very serious mistake in Buddhism. It's one of the five classic wrong views. Like in India it was this thing to jump on a spear and impale yourself or rip your skin or something and out, so that you could get some spiritual in, insights or something. And, and in Buddhism it's considered very serious bad karma to damage the car that you need to use to get there. You know, you have to take good care of it. You can't be obsessed with it, because that's a bad karma also. But you have to take, you know, cold, calculating, good care of it. Uh, or you do collect bad karma. Yeah. Yeah. How about Tabor Ken? Tabor Ken? Is yeah. The she asked about the, the, the person who helps people die. Um, Euthanasia is, in Buddhism is, is not acceptable. Uh, it's murder. Uh, period. And it comes in the Abhidharma Kosha. I can show you the reference. I have it on my computer. Third chapter, uh, 350 AD, Vasubandhu. Uh, talks about euthanasia of your parents, for example, and uh, concludes that the motivation is good. And the motivation might even create some good karma. Because, because foolishly, the person believes that this is a benefit to that person. So from the point of view of motivation, some small good karma is collected. From the point of view of the consummation of the murder of someone's parents, it's, a, it's an incredibly bad karma. And they'll have extremely terrible consequences for them karmically. And then just, just a, a, side, you know, a side comment, and the Buddha once Somebody asked him, what are the odds of coming back in a higher birth? You know, what are the odds of anyone in this room coming back as a human again? And he said, think of the number of dust particles in this entire planet. You know, go down to the core of the planet from the surface of the planet, and then go all the way across to China and the Arctic and the Antarctic, and, and think of how many particles of dust are in the whole planet. And then he licked his finger and he touched the ground. And he said, this many people go up, stay human, you know. And he said, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, so to me, it just doesn't make sense anyway. You know, I had this situation. My mother asked me to help her die or something. But, but the, 
the pain that they will experience five minutes after dying is, if, you, if you're a Buddhist, life doesn't end at all. The mind is indestructible. The mind cannot be stopped. You can blow a brains out, you know, it doesn't stop the mind, doesn't hurt the mind the least bit. Uh, it moves on. And, and the other places to go are, are horrible. They're terrible. You're not helping anybody. This is the, to be in the greatest pain possible. And the guardian has said, I can show you the quotation, the greatest pain imaginable on this level, in this plane, in this realm, is nothing compared to all the other realms. So, the person who, I mean, this is just logic, you know, the person who's suffering the most in this planet that you can be aware of is, is nothing compared to the other realms that exist. And, and you're not helping anybody. You're not putting anybody out of their pain. You know, they're going to much worse pain. Uh, let them stay, you know. Uh, try to comfort them, try to help them, you know. But, but the point is you're not helping them. You know, if you kill them, the mind is, five minutes later the mind's going to be in much greater suffering. Is, is, and the odds are something like a billion to one that it will be in much greater suffering, according to scripture. You know, I'm not making it up. It, I can show it to you in the... We have it here. Yeah. In attempting to practice dharma, can you have bad intentions? Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I mean, probably almost all your intentions are bad from <laughs> when you practice dharma. <laughs> you know? <laughs> No, I mean, uh, there's a point that you, when you reach em the direct perception of emptiness, it's very difficult to do it in this life. But one of the understandings that comes at that moment that even, even doing a ritual, a puja, you know, even doing this uh, prayer in a group, about 95% of your thoughts are non-virtuous. You know, you're thinking, what is this person thinking of me? Am I, do I look good? You know, am I reciting it nice? Do they notice that I memorized this text? Do they know my Tibetan's good, you know? Do they, I mean, seriously, honestly, without, I'm not just trying to be a bummer, you know? But uh, about 95% of human motivation is very bad. But can you do yeah. it for just the result and that be pure, or is there a purer thing? Well, there's this thing of uh, the definition of bodhicitta, right? Bodhicitta is ultimate compassion. Bodhicitta is the ultimate state of compassion. It's defined as, uh, I'll show off my Tibetan and collect some bad motivation. Um, what? Semkipani, Shenden Shir, Yanda, Zope, Changchun, Da. It means to want to get to your own Buddha paradise so you can help other people. So you can have your cake and eat it too. It's no problem. You, you're supposed to get to the highest ecstasy possible for yourself so you can really help other people. So that's no problem. It's kind of cool, you know. Uh, you, you, you are responsible to reach highest ecstasy as fast as possible, so you can really help other people. You know. Okay, twist my arm. You know? <laughs> no, not just for yourself. But, but it, those two goals are not contradictory. The it's scripture says that to to yourself only is a bad word in in, in Tibetan Buddhism. Not bashi the. Myself only is, is a curse word, you know. Only for myself is totally unacceptable. But I'm going to get there, and then, hey, then I'll be able to show everybody else how to do it. And then they can all get angel arms. Cool. You know, that's, that is bodhicitta. That's the whole thing. And it's interesting that the best thing you can do for people is to reach ecstasy yourself. That's very interesting. I mean, people get into this thing about Buddhism where it's a big, uh, you have to be sad. And you have to be, you know, this, <laughs> it's hard, you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's not like that. You have to have a good time doing good things and get enlightened. And then you have to show other people how to do it. That's the fourth perfection. What is the fourth of the six perfections? It's called, it's mistranslated as effort. And the definition, Shantideva, first line, please. Sun, Kang. Uh, you guys, gela o. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Tsungkan gela o. Definition of effort is to have a good time doing good things. It's the definition of it. You know. So yeah, you're supposed to have a good time, do virtue, get enlightened, get your Buddha paradise, and then help other people get there. And th that's your job. You know, it's like they call it a a blissful path to bliss. 
like you're gonna have a good time getting there, and it's gonna be a good time when you get there. So what's the problem? Just do it. Uh, <laughs> that's a good place to stop. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. 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 Oh, so she said, what about like in a war, like a kamikaze posit pilot who, who purposely crashes into, I mean, it's, it's, it's killing others and yourself. The only debate in the Abhidharma is who, who dies first. Because if you die first, you don't collect the full karma of killing another person. It's very interesting. If you, if you <laughs> shoot another guy, if you both shoot each other at the same moment and you die a few minutes before, you don't actually accumulate the entire karma as fully as he does. It's interesting, because you're not there anymore. Uh, it's very subtle. But aside from that, uh, killing, killing other people, which is your intention, and killing yourself, which is your intention, is probably the worst thing you can, it's probably the worst karma you could ever collect, as, as far as harming others. Terrible karma, horrible karma, very bad karma. Am I talking with you? Yeah, no. Just to do something stupid, I mean, I shouldn't say that. Shantideva defines a real hero as someone who can control their own mind. Like, it takes much more heroism not to get angry at your boss at that moment than it does to fly your plane into an aircraft carrier. It takes much more heroism. In, in Buddhism, that's considered a much her more heroic act because much fewer people can do it. You know, statistically, much fewer people can stand up to a screaming boss than can fly their airplane into an aircraft car. It's very interesting. Much more difficult than that. It's okay. All right, we'll stop there, yeah? I'm sorry, one more. Well, well she was mentioning about euthanasia. I was wondering where euthanizing an animal would fit in. Same thing. Exactly the same thing. Yeah. Don't, don't think you're doing them any favors. If you believe in Buddhism, A, the mind cannot be destroyed impossible to destroy a mind. You know, you can destroy the physical foundation upon which it rests, in which case it will simply travel on to another physical foundation. But, and the other realms are infinitely more horrible than this one. You can't imagine what they're like. You've never seen them. And they surround us. You know, we are one tiny little apartment in this huge apartment building, you know. <laughs> the, what you call your reality or your level you can imagine it as, as one little room in the Moscow Hotel, you know, 1,200 rooms. And you have no idea what's going on in the other 1,199 rooms. Horrible, <laughs> terrible suffering, you know. We are in, like, the best suite at the top, you know. And anywhere else you could go is, is horrible, horrible suffering. You're not doing anybody a favor. Don't think that. If you do that, you're saying you don't believe in future lives. If you do that, you're saying you don't believe the mind is indestructible. And you have to study more. You can, uh, you can establish that fact. I know that it's something that um, people tend to get about. Yeah. And by the way, I'm not saying, you know, judge, push, blah, blah, blah. If it did put them out of their misery, it'd be great. You see what I mean? If the mind did stop, and if the pain did stop, fantastic, do it, you know. But it, it just gets worse. It's the worst thing you can do for somebody. You know, because the next five minutes later, they're in one of those other rooms, you know, and it's terrible, it's horrible, you know. Uh, it's not helping them. And it's just that you don't know about those other rooms. But don't, don't be so, what do you call parochial, to think that this is the only apartment, you know. I mean, do you really imagine that this reality is the only one going on? And it, it's, a, it's flatly, statistically impossible that this is the only reality going on, you know. There's, there's thousands of other realities going on. You must go into one of them. And they're all horrible. They're all horrible, you know, terrible. You're not helping them. It doesn't stop. The mind doesn't stop. Yeah. The pain doesn't stop. The pain gets worse. Yeah. Um, I sort of deal with these issues all the time. Um, <coughs> if your intention is not to kill someone, your intention is to relieve their pain, and you're not intending to kill them by giving pain medication. You're intending to relieve their pain. But you're not really worrying about addiction so much because they are dying. Yeah, yeah. And at some point, what it takes to relieve their pain, they do have a respiratory system.
cessation mm -hmm. because that's what morphine and those drugs yeah. do. Is yeah. that? It's, it's all, you know. Is it the same thing? Ninety percent of uh, karmic energy is motivation. Ninety percent is motivation. Did you see what I'm yeah. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, or if someone's on life support. Yeah. And the doctors, I mean, my understanding is that with Lama Yeshe, you know, it was not considered the normal way to let a Lama die. Was mm -hmm. to come up to life support, you know, pound on the chest and, and that whole thing because he wasn't able to do. That's a totally different thing. But yeah. to, me, to me, it's yeah. not different because yeah. every day I read you deaths. Yeah. Well, what I mean is... Uh, so someone um, took them to life support, yeah. and the doctors yeah. determined no way can this person ever regain quality of life. Yeah. And they take them off life support because they don't do anything to kill them. Yeah. But without yeah. life support, they do die because yeah. brainstem functions aren't there or they have end-stage disease. I guess I'm having trouble because I don't see that as euthanasia if they're not doing yeah. something specific. Well, there's two, two issues here. Yeah. With a llama, with, like when you debate, we debate in the monastery. I don't know if you've ever seen it. <laughs> it's like, but if you're going to debate this, you have to say, Lama Pashat. Lama Pashat means, I'm, let's throw out the llamas. <laughs> Meaning, llamas have been trained for decades to die properly. Like, when they go through the death process, they're doing this incredibly beautiful symphony of activities, you know, they're like, they're like turning this whole thing into a path to enlightenment, and they know how, so they must not be disturbed, you know, they must be allowed to die quietly uh, somewhere on a bed, away from all this machinery and noise, and that can only destroy their concentration at that moment, so Lama Parshak, um, a normal person, if I mean, uh, you tell me, if, based on what I just said, what? You tell me. Oh, no, based on if what I said is true. If I, we say, Tapatasungirikpa means, assume that what I said is true. I'm not asking you to believe it. I'm really not assuming that the mind must go on. Assuming that this is the luxury suite in all of existence, and that every one other one is incredible suffering. You tell me what's the right thing to do. What? You know, yeah. No, but you, you didn't get it. You didn't get no, it. Hope for what? Hope for what? You know, no, hope that they'll recover. No, but is that state better than what they're going to? Yeah. I mean, you tell me. I mean, based on what I said, if what I said is true, I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying if if this context is true, and I'm I'm not even quoting a scripture here. I'm using logic. We're allowed to do both. <laughs> you know, if if what I if what I said is true. And if, upon death, the vast majority of all human beings suffer extraordinary, unlimited, unimaginable pain within five minutes, you tell me what's the right thing to do. Seriously, if that's, I'm just saying, if it's true. I'm not saying it's true. If it's true, what would be the right course of action? Keep them here as long as possible. To not interfere with the dog. I wouldn't say, I mean, if I was the person, if you were the person, and I gave you a choice, you can be unconscious in this realm, or even in some great pain, or you can go to a hell realm and burn there like a burning flame. Which would you prefer? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not, you know, it, I'm not expecting you to go to work tomorrow and suddenly, they'll throw you out, actually. <laughs> you know, and you know it and I know it. No, you know it and I know it, but, but logically, if, if, if the scriptures are true, if the words of an in, infallible, omniscient being are correct, uh, and if I'm the person dying, God damn keep me here as long as possible, you know? I, will I enjoy some kind of quality of life here? No. Will I be in great suffering? Yes. But is it better than where I'm going? According to scripture, infinitely better. Scripture says, I'm not, I can't see it myself. I'm not claiming to see it myself. I'm just saying, if you just follow the Buddha's own, Gautama Buddha's own pronouncements strictly, that's exactly the conclusion you have to draw. And I can show you the quotations. When he, when he yeah. said that, everything was quite different from the Buddha. I don't think so. They didn't have life support system. 
Yeah, yeah. This is the pronouncements of a person who can see the future as easily as he sees the present. For him, 1997 and, and 500 BC are absolutely no difference. We already defined it that way. He, he sees life support. He sees it as clearly as you see your hand. You know, uh, and he speaks what would be most beneficial knowing that. You see what I mean? If, if you believe this stuff, I'm not saying you have to believe it, but if you, if you put yourself in, in that belief system, that's, you, can't, you can't run away from it. It's, it's, it's there, you know, yeah. But what's the point of keeping somebody on life support if they're brain dead or if there's, they're not, there's no going back? It keeps them for five minutes out of that. So what Seriously. difference does five minutes one way or the other make? If you're the person doing it, I mean, next time you go to the dentist and say, would you like this root canal to go on five minutes longer or can we stop? No, I'm being dead serious, you know, for the person who's the payee. Uh, <laughs> It's a big difference, and it doesn't seem to be a big difference until you're the one sitting in the chair. Really, honestly, if you could escape five minutes of dreadful pain by experiencing a lesser pain in an unconscious, unfixable condition, I don't want to get to, you know, this is all theory, right? But if, if, if the Buddhist scriptures are true, just logically this would be the, the it, I'm just saying just logically. Is it economically viable? No. Does it seem to be nice to them? No. Does it make you feel good? No. You know, do they ever recover? Never, almost never. You know, I is there any other reason to do it? No. It's just that the next thing they're going to go through is much worse. But they, they should keep them from their heart. No, you can't do that. Well. When you make the effort to keep them longer, it, it is their karma, you see? You have to think of it that way. Well. Yeah. And if it wasn't their karma, you wouldn't have done it, you see? It's kind of tricky. Oh, I think it's, I think it's, uh, that the Abhidharma is very clear, and, and the example in the Abhidharma is that your parents are getting elderly, they're in some extraordinary pain, and is it the right thing to do to put them out of that pain? And, and Vasubandhu's answer, in, what do you call it, without any question, he says, horrible, terrible, it's one of the five great deeds that send you directly to a hell realm. Uh, is, is to hurt your parents like that. So he's just saying, be careful of this thing. He's, he's warning you, be careful of this thing. And that, that's all I'm saying. Uh, and I'm just straight quoting scripture. I, I don't have the power to see uh, these realms and things like that. It's dramatic when it's some very horrible thing, like killing your parents. So we're all, we're all going to the hell realm and stuff forever. No, not forever. It wears out. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we're all going there. Then you don't believe what the Buddha said. <laughs> I can show you. No, really. It's a screw. It's the. No, but I'm just saying it's it's a. It, I'm not saying it's my opinion. It's the Buddha stated this. Now, whether he meant it or not, we can discuss that. But he stated it many times, many times over. You know, uh, and it's not. Yeah. It's better yeah. to just recognize and remember who we are, where we are, and what we're doing. Yeah. And don't worry about those who motivation is absolutely pure, absolutely the best. Yeah. We don't know. That that's total horseshit about the, yeah. the hell realms and all that crap. It's yeah. total horseshit. If that belief system goes your circuit, that's great. Mm -hmm. But if What if it is true? It, it could what, very well, what if it is true? That's great. What if it is true? Then you could avoid a lot of suffering if you didn't do those things. But you're saying we're all going to hell anyway. I didn't, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said we're trying to turn this arm, arm into a nice arm. Yeah. And we're yeah. in the best room. Yeah. All the yeah. other rooms are worse. Yeah. yeah. So? Yeah, the odds are very uh, bad. Yeah. What odds? <laughs> 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 They are, but I also st went through this whole two-hour thing about trying to change this arm before you get there, right? There's a window of opportunity. Yeah, yeah, really. If you believe it, if you don't, it's okay. You don't have to, it's okay. Well, I understand. Yeah. How, yeah. how does it help people to believe this very thing? Um, <coughs> you would be kind to other people and help them and be good to I them. I don't think so. I think it does yeah. quite the opposite. I think it separates yeah. them from other people. Oh, okay. If, you know, we the Buddhists have this dogma and this mythology, and we're different from they, the Catholics. Mm -hmm. Au contraire, 
It mm -hmm. separates us. It does not bring us together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. It didn't work ever, ever, ever. Mm -hmm. When two or more groups of people get together and set up a dogma, I have it my way. This is the right way. Those poor fuckers at the best are ignorant at the worst are terrible sinners. Mm -hmm. It's horseshit. It's total mm. horseshit. You must surely feel on some level, see on some level when you're meditating mm -hmm. what absolute bullshit it is. <laughs> Quite I the opposite. Quite the opposite. And I know this yeah. is not the yeah. essence. I know yeah. this is not the essence. The Buddha said it. Hey, the Buddha said a lot of things about yeah. women, too. You yeah. know, the Buddha lived in yeah. a different time. There are times yeah. when the Buddha is flat out wrong, or those who wrote down what he said are flat out wrong. Mm -hmm. Period. Finish. Mm -hmm doesn't negate the fact that I'm a very serious student of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to hear the mythical bullshit stories mm -hmm. about the fires of hell and all this crap that I already heard in the Catholic Church. Are they impossible? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. I'm sorry. That mythology, okay. out of all the possible, yeah. yes, it's impossible. Okay. Yeah, it is. Why? Because you don't you know, like it. You don't like it. Well, it just, no, why? You don't like something that's naked. You know, the likelihood of pinpoint, having pinpointed that little vision of the kaleidoscope out of all the possibles that there are, the likelihood of that pitiful little vision being true, the accurate one, is so small that we are totally arrogant to accept it. It, it is impossible for you. Is it also impossible for um, her? No, no, not at all, not at all. But it's being laid out there as though this is the way and we must all aspire <coughs> to get across the bridge to see that this is the way you know and it's just not that way now the question would be is that what the buddha said or is it that your karma to perceive it that way same thing <laughs> same I mean, there's thing. some things that are not knowable they're just not knowable the buddha is all knowing that's what buddha means it's what his name means it isn't it So there, <laughs> there are no unknowable things. Yeah. Is there an age that karma starts I mean, is it from birth? Or is <laughs> uh, it's like this. There's three different kinds of karma. Uh, three different kinds of karma. One is a result that you see in this life, in the same life. One is a result that you see in the next life. And one is after that. So the thing about seeing your arm as an angel in a paradise, mm -hmm. is it's, it's based on the idea that you could collect such good karma that in this same life you would see something change. And so karma can kick in in this life, and it depends on your motivation. It depends on how strong your willpower is. You know? But if something happens to a small child, are they attracting them? Um, no, it, the, the act of being born was a result of karma. The act of being one year old was a result of karma. The act of getting a cough as a karma baby. Existed, that person, that mind, that soul existed before. Yeah. And, yeah. and then you have to study the nature of the mind. I mean, imagine the first moment in your mother's womb and the first thought you had. Like, what was it? Just imagine. You don't remember. Imagine. What would it be? Guess. Warmth, yeah, I think warmth, wet, you know, hot in here. <laughs> Something like that, you know. Uh, we say that that moment of consciousness, that, that first moment of awareness, must have had a moment of awareness just before it. Like, at the moment just before that, it has to have been triggered by another moment of consciousness. Like, you weren't as aware or it wasn't as conscious. But we say that any moment of consciousness must have been triggered by a moment of consciousness before that. That the stuff that your mind is made of must have come from older stuff of the same kind. This is a principle of cause. Before conception? Yeah. yeah. Which is a proof for past lives. That the mind must have existed the moment before your first thought in this life. In order to cause the thought of the first thought of this life. If you except that one moment, mm -hmm. then you accept that someone in the past existed. They did things. They put imprints in that mind. And now that mind is seeing things come out now. Yeah. So what happens to a child is, is also the same as me and my boss. 
Okay, yeah. Oh, what about I don't really know what I think I have an idea what you're going to say about this, maybe, but just to put it out there, abortion. Oh, Mida Mircha Parsepa. Sokchek Itseni. Definition of the first non virtue is to kill a human or a human fetus. Period. What about preventing? No problem. No problem at all. As long as it doesn't. Yeah, at the moment of. Once the sperm and the egg have met, uh, we believe that consciousness has started. To, but to prevent them from meeting is no problem. That's not, you haven't uh, killed anything, because there's been no consciousness up to that point. But the definition of murder, of killing, uh, in Buddhism is to kill a, a human or a human fetus after the moment of conception, period. And there's no, there's no question at all. It comes, we have, on the, we have a computer. We, uh, we spent 10 years, some of the people here have worked on it, uh, inputting the ancient books of Buddhism. We've input, uh, 115,000 pages of, of all the great writings of the Buddha, everything the Buddha taught. Much of it is already in the computer. And I can show you probably 300 times where he said that. And he never said the opposite. So there's really no question at all. And, and in many of these things, there's no, you know, if you're a Buddhist and, and if you're going to say, I follow the Buddha, you can now, with a computer, you can look through every single word he ever said. And he always said it that way, over and over, hundreds and hundreds of times. So maybe one is a, is a miswriting or something, but, but there doesn't exist a Buddhist scripture by the Buddha that exists in the world today that, that doesn't say exactly that, and which doesn't say those other things are true. And, and it's there, it's right, you know. Or you, or you can say it's not the Buddhist or that the Buddha didn't ever say any of those th anything, you know, but that gets, it's just not, not the case. We have it all. It's in my laptop. I carry it around with me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and by the way, that's why we put the effort into it. We spent 10 years. There are hundreds of monks uh, typing. So before and, uh, you do anything, you can. <laughs> yeah, and the Buddha has exactly said that. He said it three or four hundred times in the sutras. I hope you have uh, a backup. <laughs> no, we store it all over the world, all over the world. The 10,000 discs already, uh, copies of it. But, uh, but you, c you know what he said, and he didn't say anything else than that. That's exactly what he said, and that's all. That's, that it's very, if you're going to be a Buddhist, that's what he said. You know, yeah? What is the definition of trauma? Uh, Tibet, Purple Rinpoche. Nope, okay. Lele Jiten Nath, okay? Deni Semba Dandeche. That's the definition of karma. Um, thinking. So okay. Is what you call co concentrate. Uh, anytime your mind moves, that's karma. You know, and you have 65 karmic events per, per finger snap. But your mind moves. You have 65 tiny motions of your mind in the time it takes me to snap my fingers. And each one of those is karma. Then when it causes you to say something or do something, that's also karma. But the main karma is, is when you think. So yeah. I assume this definition is accepted in all four schools, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 So I quoted you the lowest school the lowest by Bhashika, Abhidharma, fourth chapter, opening lines. So they are slightly different yeah. huh? according to those schools. Yeah.